answer questions in real time here in the room. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can enter it in chat and hopefully I'll be able to get, get it to work. Uh, there are also captions available if you need to do that. You gotta just pick, find the captions option and pick that. Also, I invite you to visit our website, citizenstransit.org, uh, for more information about us and how you can join. So we have three speakers uh, today, or four actually, two are teaming up. Uh, first speaker is uh, first speaker is uh, Jeff Applement. Uh, he serves as planning project manager in the MFTA Metro's service planning department, where he's currently managing the environmental review process for the Met the Amherst Metro Transit Expansion Project, the project we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, previously, Jeff served as assistant uh, manager of NFTA's grants and government affairs. A department where he helps secure, manage, and advocate for state and federal funding to support public transit and aviation capital projects uh, and initiatives across Western New York. Jeff uh, has a bachelor's degree in economics and urban studies from Canisius College and has a master's degree in urban planning from uh, UB here at the University of Buffalo, another alumni with <laughs> the rest of us. Uh, Jim Gordon. Uh, he is our treasurer of Citizens Regional Transit. He is also a UB alumnus, very familiar with the bus system and the transit system. And so we'll be talking about that. Uh, he is a member of UB's Emeritus Center, is chair of the UB Professional Staff Senate Sustainable, Sustainable Living Committee's Subcommittee on Alternative Transportation, is a member of the Golden Key National Honor Society, and Jim is a member of the Beta Gamma Sigma International Business Honor Society, and tonight he'll be talking uh, on behalf of Citizens for Regional Transit. We have uh, Kelly Haynes McElhoney uh, is an architect and director of campus planning at the at UB here, and the 2012 president of American Institute of Architects, New York State. Kelly has dedicated her profession to educational architecture. Among the notable projects in which she was has been involved, while at UB is the New School for Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, the signature project for uh, UB 2020. Most recently, Ms. McElhoney uh, is, was involved in designing the beautiful New One World Cafe, which is adjacent to the library that we are sitting in. Ms. McElhoney is a recipient of many prestigious awards, including the collaboration with Mattel on the, uh, the design and launch of Barbie, I Can Be an Architect. Uh, she has received the EB Green Distinguished Service Award from AIA Buffalo Western New York. Ms. McElhoney uh, won the Young Architect of the Year Award. Uh, in uh, AIA Buffalo, Western New York. Our next speaker after her is Chris Austin, who leads and directs the operations, communications, and future planning for UB's Office of Parking and Transportation Services. Chris has more than 20 years of progressive, professional management and leadership experience in the parking uh, and oversees operations for uh, that uh, transport for over uh, two and a half million passengers annually, providing attractive, sustainable alternatives to single occupant travel. Uh, he has combined 12 years of service on the Board of Parking Directors for the City of Buffalo and New York State Parking Association, and Chris is a certified administrator of public parking. We also have two panelists who will be speaking. Uh, following the, the presentations. Uh, first is Lawrence Mullen, a PhD student and teaching assistants, assistant in the English department. Uh, they received a BA in English with a concentration in creative writing from Temple University, graduating with departmental distinction. Additionally, they received an MFA in creative writing and a, uh, with a concentration on poetry from Arcadia University graduating from, with honors. While attending Arcadia, uh, they were uh, a war, wartime scholar 
an Ellington Beavers Award and Intellectual uh, Inquiry Awardee with Graduate Writing Center Tudor. Their current research is focused on 19th century American Gothic literature and contemporary horror films and television shows. shows. Mullins is a graduate student, employees union, elected president. And our finalist, our final uh, panelist is uh, Monica Chu. I hope I pronounced that right, or Che. Okay, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, she is a, a graduate student here at UB in the Department of Oral Biology. She's a PhD candidate, and she's uh, she uses the the, the bus uh, regularly as part of her transporting here at UB. So she'll be able to provide some insights after our speakers speak. Apologize for the late start, and uh, let me turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Jeff Appleman. You done? Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, let me thank on behalf of the NFK Citizens for Regional Transit. Um, not only for having me here today, but also um, for your continued advocacy in uh, support of public transit uh, across Western New York. We certainly appreciate your partnership. And with your help, we've been able to secure a lot of funding over the years to support some really important capital and, and operating projects here uh, for the NFTA across Western New York. I'd also like to thank UB for graciously hosting us today. As a 2015 uh, graduate of the School of Architecture and Planning, it is always a pleasure to, uh, to get to come back to the home of the Bulls. Um, and coincidentally, I also met my wife here several years ago, so it has a special uh, little place in my heart. Uh, so today I've been asked to provide just a quick update on our Buffalo Amherst uh, Metro Transit Expansion Project. Um, so with that in mind, what I'd like to do first is just kind of do a broad overview of our project background a little bit on the historical um, information what led us to this point today, um, as well as the purpose and need for the project. Um, I'll then describe the two build alternatives that we are evaluating as part of our environmental review process. Um, I'll then provide a little information on the NEPA process, which is the federal environmental review uh, process and the schedule moving over the next couple months and year. Um, I'll do a little quick summary of the NEPA scoping uh, process that we held back in the fall, which was an opportunity for the public to provide um, some comments as well as agencies to provide comments on the project. Um, I'll do a quick uh, overview of the environmental analysis that's currently being done for the project. And then I'll provide some next steps um, moving forward um, even past the environmental review process. And then for questions and comments, I think just to keep the program moving, we'll do all that at the end, right, Doug? Yeah, that's probably the best way to do it. Of course. Yeah. Great. Very good. So as many of you probably know, uh, the NFTA is currently proposing to expand our transit system, high quality, high frequency transit from the current terminus at the UB South Campus um, through the towns of Amherst and Tonawanda through this very campus here to just north of the I-990 um, interchange Autobahn area. Um, the purpose of the project is really to link current and emerging activity centers along the current rail line in the city of Buffalo with current and emerging activity centers in both town of Amherst and town of Tonawanda. And specifically um, to really connect the region's highest concentration of people um, within this corridor to um, activity centers such as all three UB campuses, um, the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, um, the Boulevard Mall site, um, and then the entertainment center um, in the downtown Buffalo area, including uh, the Canal Side Cobblestone District and the Central Business District. Um, also, the project would improve livability and increase mobility options for a variety of users, including our transit dependent population. Um, and the need for the project is specific to three key areas that is to serve current uh, and future travel demand, to provide high quality regional transit service, which is consistent with the mission of the NFTA. And as I mentioned, to improve service for our transit dependent populations who make up a pretty large portion of our current ridership. So as a little bit of a historical background, I know some of the members here from CRT know all about the original transportation plan for the region that was developed back in the 1960s. That plan included an extension of um, the rail service through the towns of Amherst and Tonawanda. It was not uh, obviously built and we stopped just at the UB South Campus. But the, the efforts for expanding through Amherst and Tonawanda really picked up pace in 2012, where the NFTA, uh, in partnership with the Greater Buffalo Niagara Regional Transportation Council, which is the um, Metropolitan Planning Organization. There's a lot of acronyms there um, for the region. Um, joined together to put together an alternative analysis to evaluate a range of transit options that could meet the purpose and need um, for this corridor. Um, and out of that, um, what developed was a three-tier evaluation that ranked a variety of transit modes um, on ridership, on their economic impact, um, on their impact for NFTA finances, for example. And what we ended up coming with, out with was a locally preferred alternative that recommended a light rail alternative using the Niagara Falls Boulevard alignment um, that would not only meet the purpose and need for this project, but 
have the best chance of competing for federal funding to eventually uh, construct the project. So it was that alternative that we refined a little bit in the uh, at the end of the decade. And then through 2018 and 2020, we advanced it through what is the State Environmental Quality Review Act, um, which the NFTA served as the lead agency for. Um, it is during this process, especially when we went to public comment, that the Federal Transit Administration hopped on board, recognizing that we would eventually um, pursue federal funding for the project and offer to be the lead federal agency uh, for the project. And that required us to shift our focus from the seeker process to the federal NEPA process, which is the National Environmental Policy Act. They're two very similar processes, but they are different. Great. So what has changed? What has changed since the last time we've been here in front of this group other than COVID, which is obviously one of the big reasons we haven't you know, been able to meet in public in a long time. Um, first, as I mentioned, the FTA will now be the lead agency for our environmental review process with the NFTA serving as the co-lead agency and utilizing this, the um, State Environmental Quality Review Act work that we've done a few years ago, um, we're going to be able to put together a federal environmental review process. And what's important about that is a, it positions us to not only compete for it, but secure federal funding. And because we've already done a lot of this work under the secret process, and we can use it to inform and streamline that process. So hopefully uh, get it done a little bit quicker. Um, FTA also, in addition to um, the light rail, locally preferred alternative had requested that we evaluate a bus rapid transit alternative as well um, throughout the corridor. So that's something I'll discuss here in a couple of months. All right, so the, the, the um, build alternative that we're looking at first, all environmental review processes require you to look at a no build alternative, which is a future case scenario where you don't do anything. You don't build anything and you, know, you evaluate what the conditions might be like under those situations. But what we're most likely uh, concerned with here is the bus rapid transit and the light rail transit build alternatives. Um, you all are all very familiar, I'm sure, with the LRT alternative, right? It's the, um, the form that a current metro rail system takes, um, uses dedicated light rail uh, right away, uh, light rail vehicles, dedicated stations to rapidly move people um, throughout a defined corridor. Uh, the bus rapid transit alternative isn't really that much different. Um, it uses dedicated busway and dedicated right away for um, usually articulated buses, which is a bus that's connected in the middle via an accordion style um, connection. It has dedicated stations, also uses transit signal priority technology to um, coordinate the bus travel times with uh, the signals throughout the corridor and then improves travel times and the performance of the uh, of the system. Um, so those are the two build up terms that we're going to be evaluating throughout our environmental review process. All right, so as far as the actual alignments go, those are also not very different um, from the two uh, build alternatives. The, the LRT build alternative um, and the BRT alternative both begin at the University of Buffalo South Campus, which is the current terminus of the uh, existing Metro Rail line. Briefly travels along Main Street and Kenmore Avenue, um, comes up Niagara Falls Boulevard, makes a right on Maple Road and Sweet Home Road through the University of Buffalo North Campus, through the Audubon community, and terminates just north of the I-990 interchange. The primary differences between the two build alternatives are highlighted in these red circles. Um, for the LRT alternative, naturally because the system is already underground at the South Campus, it has to continue underground until it can alight or come above ground um, just north of Kenilworth on Niagara Falls Boulevard. And also at the intersection of Maple and Sweet Home, we would also traverse under the intersection there to avoid potential um, conflicts with traffic. Um, the BRT build alternative would be at grade surface running the entire line. However, it would require a transfer to the existing light rail system at the university at South Campus. All right, so where are we right now? Um, the NFT in partnership with a consulting team is preparing, a, as I mentioned, a NEPA environmental impact statement, which assesses the potential of socioeconomic and physical impacts of the project and then develops mitigation measures um, for any adverse impacts that are potentially identified. Um, it also provides an opportunity uh, for the public to participate in the environmental process, um, provide any feedback or concerns they may have uh, throughout the uh, environmental review process. So back in August, we uh, or the Federal Transit Administration issued a notice of intent to begin this process, which kicked off a 45 day scoping period, which is an opportunity for the public to provide any comments they may have on the project, express their concerns. And so that went through October. That included two virtual scoping sessions um, which I'll summarize in a second. We are currently uh, preparing the draft environmental impact statement. Uh, following that, we will release that for public comment that includes agencies as well as the general public. Uh, we will take that comment uh, period and any feedback that we get from it and integrate that into 
um, a draft final environmental impact statement, and eventually a record of decision. Yes. All right, so the, open, uh, the NEPA scoping period uh, wrapped up in the fall. As I mentioned, we had two virtual uh, scoping sessions. They were attended by over 100 people, uh, which is pretty good participation, I think. Uh, we received 82 comments total um, from advocacy organizations like CRT, uh, residents, other associations. And comments could have been submitted uh, via a number of um, methods, including email, uh, the project website or mail, and the verbal testimony uh, through those, those public meetings. Um, so just kind of to summarize what we heard as a result of those meetings and the various uh, mediums that people could uh, provide comments, there was general project support, there was opposition to the project, some people commented on design considerations and operations, uh, environmental impacts, and various transportation and funding related issues. Um, but to drill down a little bit more into that, as far as support goes, some people offered support for one of the modes, you know, either LRT or the BRT. Um, some folks, as far as opposition goes, may have been opposed to the whole project, but also maybe just portions of the project or certain segments of the alignment. Um, some people did express some concern, obviously, regarding transportation, traffic throughout the corridor, um, as well as concerns around property acquisition and noise and vibration, um, which we all had heard during the secret process a few years ago. Uh, but if you're really interested in um, you know, hearing a little bit more about the comments and our responses to those, we have all that information um, posted on our project website. NFTA Metro Transit Expansion.com. So where are we today? As I mentioned, the consultant group that we have on board is putting together our draft environmental impact statement that looks at all these potential areas and the adverse impacts that might be related to them. Um, and as I mentioned, utilizing the seeker process that we've done a few years ago, um, we can take the public comments that we had, as well as the analysis that was done to really streamline this and, and make this a more efficient process. All right, and so where are we going over the next couple of months? and year for that matter. Um, our goal is by fall of 2022 to release the draft environmental impact statement for public comment and agency review. We will then hold another round of public hearings in the late fall to get, uh, gather some public input. Uh, we will take that input, integrate that into the final, in, final environmental impact statement in the winter of 2022 slash 2023. And our goal is to issue the final environmental impact statement and statement of findings um, by the spring of 2023. Concurrently with this, we will also be start um, with conceptual design for the project and hopefully begin the process of entry into the Federal Transit Administration's uh, Capital Investment Grant Program to apply for funding that would support eventual construction. And with that, I think that's up. And like I said, Doug, I'll, I'm happy to take questions after the meeting and whatnot. Yeah, sure, you bet. you bet. Thanks for running. So thank you all for uh, inviting us and for attending th this evening. Um, sadly, my co-presenter, Chris Austin, the director uh, for parking transportation, is unable to attend today's meeting uh, due to an illness. So uh, sadly, he cannot he cannot make it. So I, I will though speak to the campus planning side of the work that we do. Uh, and as was mentioned in my um, introduction, as a director of campus planning, uh, our office oversees the master planning for the institution in terms of identifying new buildings we want to bring online, renovations of buildings. We do small project renovations, um, but we also do siting um, and work with uh, many of our colleagues on um, uh, street layouts, on uh, sidewalks, on uh, all sorts of uh, traffic, whether it's pedestrian, uh, vehicular or bicycle, et cetera. And we've been working with the NFTA, our office, and, and me in particular, for the past four or five years on this project uh, as a representative of the university in the stakeholder conversation. So I'm going to begin uh, just by talking about the history of North Campus. This is very high level. I uh, could just proceed yet next one. So, and and the, obviously, I, anybody who's been on North Campus understands that this is very much a vehicular oriented campus. It was designed at a time in the late 1960s. The uh, modernists uh, and the urbanists at the time, they were very heavy handed in their approach. And they, they were excited by the idea of creating a new type of campus. So again, very muscular, very heavy handed, um, very optimistic. Um, they thought they were creating a very systems-based 
research serious institution that really did not address the human condition, I would say. It was really focused on um, you know, design excellence, research excellence, teaching excellence, et cetera. That's not, it's not a defense, just as a sort of as a as an idea. And it was, I think, in a way seen as a utopia, you know, this we're going to create this place like in the middle of, you know, a farm in the middle of nowhere. And it's going to be a serious place for, you know, people and they can just ensconce themselves in academia. So, again, not to defend it, but just to place it. Um, and the idea is that you'd be able to get in and out very quickly. And, but, uh, you know, that's why there's highways all around. Of course, it was supposed to be a much larger, po larger population wise campus than, than what was it was built for. So that's why we have much more infrastructure than the campus needs in terms of highways. But it was also designed to accept to be part of a mass rapid transit system that was going to connect the entire city. So um, this drawing is from the 1970 Sasaki Partners Master Plan, and it called for two rapid transit stations. So this one. Ex excuse me. Are, are, do we have the wrong s part of that on on the teams? Is that what you were saying? No, I'm, I was trying to be full screen, and I can't actually see the slide myself. Okay. I'd be happy to share that, but, but it, it is really fascinating to see how the campus was originally conceived versus what was built. Um, the original, if you can believe it, this is, these are the, the Cockstetter. <laughs> yeah. Are, what were the Cockstetter? There are only two of them. There were supposed to be 12, those towers, and they were meant to be the health sciences complex. And that was where one of them was going to go here. Yeah, one of these is. The other one was going to go uh, adjacent to the cultural center, which had the um, uh, it, it, which had the uh, you know the Lumen Arena and what's now Lumen Arena and the Center for the Arts, and then the final oh and also oh, what did we call it? It was the yeah, the cultural center. And then finally, there was another one that was off campus, but that was meant to service the sports facilities. So those were the three uh, ideas. And it, it breaks my heart when I read that, because what it says in black and white is the fact that um, the NFTA is currently investigating a, bus, a rapid transit system, and they're expecting in 1971 for uh, the results to uh, be published. But we anticipate this campus to be, you know, to design two, three, two stations on campus and one north of the campus to accommodate the university activities. So it was always intended, and we do have the infrastructure, the roads in place to accommodate a light rail system. Or, oh, not, it wasn't even a light rail at the time, a rail system to campus. Um, so the one thing it didn't address, of course, was like the main academic, what became our academic spine it really wasn't going to be part of that. And we would have been built much further away from the heart of the campus, from say Cape and, and, and what we're planning right now. But they, it was always planned for that. We can move on to the next slide. Review this that again. Does everybody get it? Oh, everybody got it? OK, great. So fast forward uh, to uh, several decades. Um, and uh, to you can just please fast forward to the next to the 2009 when we um, unveiled the comprehensive master plan uh, for that that called for not two but three campuses. Um, and and the, the the comprehensive master plan, what we call UB 2020, uh, the blue book we referred to, it had five main components. One was to create a downtown campus by moving the Jacobs School of Medicine downtown. The second was to revitalize our South Campus by uh, bringing up professional schools to South Campus and reimagine that historic campus um, uh, and, and, and connect it more strongly to the community. And the third was to reimagine our North Campus as a research and um, undergraduate educational center of excellence. 
And then the other two components were to um, enhance the campus experience, i.e. the student experience, so really embrace the campus environment and, you know, um, uh, connect, you know, the, the human condition to the campus and find the deferred our deferred or address the deferred maintenance at our campuses. Each of two of our campuses certainly had um, uh, incurred. So this is a drawing, a mapping of what we had imagined the uh, the system, how it would go through campus at that time. And at when we called what you'll see, we called it the BRT slash LRT because we didn't. After what happened in the 1970s, in our wildest dreams, it did not occur to us that we would be able to go straight to a, a light rail transit, light rail train, that there would probably have to be a phased approach where. We would introduce bus rapid transit and then a uh, light rail, but that's of course not where where we're hoping uh, to go. But the thought was that we would come up to a sweet home, we would enter probably, uh, or we might enter through Millersport, but in all likelihood be through Wrench, and then we would uh, we'd circumnavigate the campus through the north of the spine. So this would run along uh, what is now. Mary Talbert Way on the north side, and then up to Lee Road, and then on. And then the thought was there would be a station uh, very close to this is Capen Hall, so just outside of Capen, right across the street from St. Talbert Hall. There would be a station at the Student Union or thereabouts. And then there would be a station somewhere around what's where the roundabout is now at the end of Lee Road, or where Lee Road intersects Audubon, and then it would move along. So that's what the thought was in 2009. Next slide, please. And you can see this is a rendering of what we imagine, we still imagine Lee Road, how that would look once Lee Road is built. So this is Clemen, Clemens Hall, this is Student Union. Is this our rail? And then this is activity. So the idea is that we have, you know, we have a very urban experience, you know, very vibrant, dense urban experience on our campus. Next slide. So the work that our, our office is doing now is we are de developing the implementation plans for uh, through the three campuses, but in particular uh, North Campus, because of course downtown campus has been created, and I'll talk about that in a minute. South Campus, we've been doing a lot of work and the work on revitalizing the South Campus has been taking place since before we moved the Jacob School of Medicine uh, to downtown campus. And so you've probably seen a lot of work going on there. So now we're really planning our North Campus work, but it really has three main components. First, strengthen the academic spine, make it more, you know, densify it and make it a more pleasant place to be. So the work that you're seeing right now in the heart of the campus project, Silverman, uh, One World Cafe, that's all part of that work. Develop Lee Road. So this space here, connect really the elegant campus, deal with the academic time, really realize what was planned in the Sasaki master plan, build the long here. The, big, the first thing we did to make that happen was we built the roundabout, Anybody who was on campus before 2010 will remember how separate these two spaces felt. And just by putting, getting rid of the lights, what a huge transformation that was. And then when we built Griner Hall, that added it. What we need to do now is build along here to really to, to create what was envisioned. And then the third piece, which is maybe one of the biggest mistakes we made when we started to fully build out the campus, was we cut off most important amenity we have on campus, which is Lake LaSalle. So we're, the whole idea is to connect Lake LaSalle, take down that crazy berm and embrace it and, and build along here and, and have a really wonderful bucolic experience, in, you know, in this wonderful, on this wonderful campus. Next slide. So, so what have we put in place thus far? South, uh, downtown campus, what did we do? This was something that our office was very much involved in. We placed our school of medicine on a um, on a rail on a line. We this was a deliberate and actually difficult task. Jeff can tell you we worked with the NFTA. We worked with, with the FTA 
uh, it took a lot of work. We had to purchase a bank. We had, or at least have, you know, work with a bank so they could move. We had to work with, again, the FTA, the, NF, the, the feds at multiple levels to build on a, um, on a subway station. And that was deliberate so that we could create a coatless environment between our South Campus and our downtown campus. And then, of course, we've been, we are repurposing, we are repopulating our, our South Campus. We're encouraging our students of medicine to commute back and forth. There's free parking on South Campus for them, or certainly reduced parking. They're encouraged, and we certainly encourage the health sciences schools to go back. So the whole idea is that these two campuses now are very much connected by the rail and what's missing. On campus. Next slide, please. So again, this is this is the build out plan for North Campus. So you can see once we're built out, you know, this again, one world is the start of what we expect, how the spine will be really the academic spine will be really transformed once we're able to address the human condition at this level. When we start building the buildings along Lee. And then open up to the lake. Um, the train will, the line will become even more important. And where we're, I, where we're planning, actually, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So next slide. And then this the extension. So the work that we've been doing again. So station one, downtown campus. Station two, south campus. Station three, four, and five would be on north campus. So. What we're thinking now is that there would be three stations on North Campus. One would be located just outside of Park Hall, and it would, it would connect to the to the academic spine. This is the road that I told you was built to house the, we don't see it as a road because it's not a road, but infrastructure-wise, it was built to accommodate um, the rail line. It will then turn up Lee Road, and there will be a stop uh, right at the spots that's now the, um, we'll be hopefully a building, but right around the student union. So in that in that general area where the, where the bus stop now actually, uh, along here. And then the final loop, and so this one side will address special events uh, locations and activities, plus also the, so the students and the activity that goes on on the side of campus. And then finally, the third stop, will address the students uh, and activities that are located in the Olympic Conference. And then the station goes on, I don't know, miles or whatever it is north of North Campus. So the thought is these three campuses will be connected with a one seat ride. And that has been something that the university has been stating over and over and over again. BRT is nice. That doesn't give us the one seat ride. You need to be able to connect our campuses with a one c ride, which is why we went to so much trouble to build on top of a station for the Jacobs School of Medicine project. And so these are the how these three, uh, so there'd be a station again outside the park, whether it's integrated with Park Hall, who knows? Right now it's just a box. Again, would be part, part of a larger infrastructure project, buildings that are occurring or that will occur in the future. And then Again, this probably will be a standalone station up there. Right? And whatever station means is TBD. So whether that means it's an actual building, whether that means it's a pavilion, you know, it's right now these are these are uh, we had not fully fleshed that out yet. And I think that's it. Great. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. So I'm up next, but I, I'm also running the show. So hang on just a moment. So I have to thank Jeffrey and Kelly. They pretty much took all of my slides. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to go through really fast because I don't want to bore you with duplication of what I uh, what they've already said. Um, so uh, there's a lot of acronyms and a lot of words being used. Uh, I'm going to define rapid transit in a very specific way. Uh, that's having transit vehicles on a dedicated 
uh, in transit jargon, it's called guideway. Most people think of it as a roadway, uh, nonstop between stations where the transit vehicles are running 50 miles an hour or faster, and the stations are farther apart than they would be in local service. Uh, the acronym for bus rapid transit, BRT, um, there's two real kinds of acronyms. One is LRRT for rapid, and then just regular LRT, which is something less. It's more like enhanced transit, but it isn't as fast necessarily as running 50 miles an hour. It might be a little slower, maybe uh, at 40, 45 miles an hour, maybe less. The, the gold standard is what we have. This is the university station. Uh, we're looking at a transit vehicle that runs unobstructed. There's no cross streets. There's no pedestrians to deal with. This train can run it faster than 50 miles an hour. It takes exactly three and a half minutes to get from this station down to the Amherst Street station where I always get on. It's extremely precise. It's very fast. It's great. Bus rapid transit, really, as Jeff already mentioned, you just swap out the rail car for a bus. Other than that, you need almost all the same infrastructure if you want to get that same kind of speed. Now I'm going to pick up on Jeff's slide. I actually stole his slide a little bit there. Uh, back in the 1960s, uh, some history. UB was a private institution until 1962. 1962, we became part of SUNY, the State University of New York. Four years later, the plans for the North Campus, where we're sitting right here, were made. That very same year, in conjunction with the NFTA, the plans for the Metro Rail to downtown to North Campus were made. These two things happened simultaneously. They worked together. Uh, 73, funding was secured. 74, UB released its comprehensive plan. Uh, Kelly just told us about the UV 2020 comprehensive plan. This is the 1974 <laughs> comprehensive plan. And then the next year, there was catastrophe for UB and Metrorail. Um, before I get into that, um, April 20th, 1972, then President Ketter said, it's impossible to envision sufficient parking areas or roadways to accommodate the density of use that is projected for either the South Campus or the North Campus. And by later that year, December, the specifications were finalized. And I found this to be very interesting. The Buffalo Amherst Corridor has a revised target date for completion of January 1978. We were already in the engineering phase when all of this was going on. That's even further along the process than we are right now. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, so it's engineering would come next after, after the draft environmental impact statements. Those in the university community may be riding the trains even sooner. An initial section of the line linking the present Main Street campus with the new Amherst campus should be operating 15 months earlier than the rest of the line around November 1976. I mean, here we are. Uh, that was at a public meeting just like this one. The NFPA was here, UB people were here, and we're living the 1976s all over again. And what happened? Something totally extraneous to UB, totally extraneous to Western New York. New York City was on the brink of bankruptcy, the state, had to go in and bail out New York City. That meant funding across the state, Kelly knows, got all sent to New York City. If you read this edition of the Spectrum, you will read that UB was about to close its doors. That's how drastic it was. SUNY Fredonia, ready to close. SUNY itself, in deep trouble. And, I, and Kelly's smiling over there. <laughs> She knows this stuff, I think. North of UB campus, the Amherst New Community, which is now called Walton Woods, that was halted by the Urban Development Corporation. It was supposed to have 27,000 people there, and it was partially built, just like this stuff was all underway, and it just got cut. And in that same article, the Freeze at Audubon, 
places in doubt the future of the proposed Buffalo Amherst Rapid Transit Corridor for which federal funds were already pending. It was funded and by the federal, but the state part went away. We didn't get it and there we sat. We're gonna fast forward to November 19th, 2008. Kelly mentioned this, the UB 2020 comprehend Comprehensive Plan. Um, Kelly's department, I think, deserves a lot more credit than Kelly was talking about. I look at that department, Kelly, as the visionaries that saved the campus, that made the campus. This beautiful room that we're sitting in right now is all part of that plan. And uh, the New One World Cafe, Kelly had a hand in that. And I just ate there tonight and it just opened. It isn't even all fully opened yet. And it's great. It's just amazing. Uh, they did it in conjunction with the Professional Staff Senate, the Faculty Senate. Um, go a little further forward than 2008, UB 2020 fully realized, as, as, as good as it was planned, when Bob Shibley was talking to the Professional Staff Senate in a meeting just like this one, everything he said, we grew, we didn't reduce the quality of our student body, we increased the quality of our student body. We get more students wanting to come here now than ever. This is amazing. We're up to 32,800 students and another seven, 8,000 faculty and staff. We're looking at a 40,000 person organization right here. Kelly is nodding yes. If I say anything wrong, please correct me because Kelly knows this even better than me. Uh, what about the current expansion? <coughs> at the very first scoping meeting, we asked, we were told that if we wanted any hope of federal funding, we had to go for transit oriented development. That was the priority under Obama and Trump administrations. Uh, and this is the same date that is on Jeff's slide, October 14th, 2021. That was the close of public comments. And we were all rah, 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 let's go, 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 rail, rail, rail all the way for CRT, and at least that was our opinion. And uh, five days later, the Federal Transit Administration said, oh, we're changing all the priorities. We've got this new thing called Justice 40, where we're going to emphasize equity and mobility justice. 40% of the money from the bipartisan infrastructure law now has to go to disadvantaged communities. And the emphasis is no longer on transit-oriented development. And our comments were all about how great this is for transit-oriented development. We were like, beside ourselves, why didn't they, why did they close it within five days of this, knowing that they were gonna come out with a new set of priorities? So fortunately we wrote to them, they were nice enough and they said, yes, we will accept revised comments. So that was very nice of the FTA. And then last Thursday, <laughs> just six days ago, they came out with a whole nother new set called the Equity Action Plan. This is uh, Justice 40 is the centerpiece of it. And there are lots of other things. There's 12 new bullet points that you can see, and I'm not gonna sit here and read them. Uh, Citizens for Regional Transit already has told the FTA that we think that the current proposal that was submitted by the NFTA meets the criteria of these new priorities. We actually think that they should use the Buffalo Metro Rail Extension Project as the poster child for their new priorities and show that they are actually ready to put these things into action. Um, one of the things though about the NFTA's uh, request, the Federal Transit Administration kicked it back and they said, uh, as Jeff said, they're looking at either LRT, BRT or do nothing. And we got the feeling that they wanted a heavy, they really wanted us to use bus rapid transit. They wanted us to, take another really hard look at bus rapid transit. Now the original submission, the draft environmental impact statement that NFTA submitted, explained why bus rapid transit wasn't the best alternative, but they wanted us to relook at it. So we told the FTA why we thought BRT would not work. Uh, two of the factors that we uh, talked about were capacity and equity. Um, so I got into a little bit heavy here because we're at UB. I said, well, we can maybe talk about Poisson and the queuing theory. Um, I'm not gonna get into the calculations, but essentially it means that buses will bunch and it means that buses will be late. Um, when you're running buses in mixed traffic, you're gonna go through intersections 
and delays will cause the buses to form chains. What you're seeing on this slide is the last three in a five chain of buses. Uh, and the BRT alignment has 10 congestion points, which will pretty much guarantee that the buses will bunch. With LRT, with rail, you don't get that because you don't have very close together, they're called headways, or the amount of time between the buses or the trains. Bus has 45 people on it, maybe. It can put up to 700 on a four car transit train. So the buses, Currently combined UB and NFTA are running every three and a half minutes on average. The train will run every 10 minutes. So that means there's space between them. They won't bunch. We won't have uh, delays or lates. Even now we have traffic signal optimization. Uh, there's this thing called MyoVision, which was deployed already in the town of Amherst. New York State is deploying it. And the GBNRTC, you've heard that acronym earlier, that's the organization where all of the communities send their representatives. And all the communities in both Erie and Niagara County have agreed to deploy these artificially controlled, artificially intelligence controlled traffic systems. They're great. They reduce pollution enormously because they almost totally eliminate red lights and waiting. They reduce the queues for waiting in line. They have bus priority built in, which is so cool because that's what we want to have. How long have we had problems with capacity in our bus system here at UB? So in September 10th, 1974, this letter to the editor, yeah, even with the extra buses they added for the morning rush hours, people are still packed in like sardines. Do we still have that now? Yes, thank you to queuing theory. We'll always have it on the buses. More importantly is mobility, justice, equity, and accessibility. The South Campus Rail Station is a barrier, and it makes it very difficult for people with disabilities, and it really sends a bad message to the, to the community about what to do. This is what you have to do if you want to use the South Campus Station and get to the North Campus. You're coming from Buffalo, you get off the train, you go up a very long escalator, go by, see the new transit fare system, that's pretty cool. And you can go over here and take the 44 bus, which takes the exact same route to the North Campus as the uh, UB Stampede. And let's see, get over here. And when I went there, I said, uh oh, there's no bus here. Looked around, nope, no bus. So I said, well, I might be able to sneak onto the stampede. And you can either take the stairs or you can take, I don't know if you can see on this wall, there was supposed to be an escalator in that corner. Did you know that, Jeff? Yes, that's supposed to be an escalator. If you look down there at the floor, you can even see there's a little sculpture of an escalator and a place for the escalator's motor to go. But they never built the escalator. And then you, I'm going to get on the elevator and go up. And this is what a, a person has to go through to get to the campus from the city. You have to go through the door and it says walk like a penguin. And you go over one lane of slushy traffic and you go over a second lane of slushy traffic. And somebody thought I was walking too slow and passed me. Go over yet a third lane of slush and then a fourth lane and my cursor slipped and we go up and we finally get up to the BRT thing. Uh, this is, I, from my point of view, this sends a very bad message. It's like, if you don't own a car, you can't go to UB North Campus. Almost 30% of the people in the city of Buffalo live in households that do not have cars. So we're losing out for people to go to work a third of the workforce almost. We're looking, kicking out potential students. This is not a good thing. How long does it take to get here? Um, this is a classic denial of access. I used to live at 246 Lemon Street in Buffalo, so I typed that into Google Maps and it says, if I leave at 408, I'll get there in an hour and 47 minutes, including 17 minutes worth of walking. But I could get there in 16 minutes by driving. The idea of transit equity, mobility equity, is 
that it shouldn't really take that much longer by public transit to get someplace. So hopefully we're encouraged by all of this, uh, the, the Federal Transit Administration's emphasis on equity. We think this is a big plus for our submission. We're hoping it is. Um, there's an expression that I hear over and over again, and it bothers me a lot. It's the train to nowhere. I think it diminishes the UB campus, South campus. I think it diminishes the people who take transit. I think it diminishes the, uh, the transit stations all along the entire route. To me, every one of those stations is important. People go there, they live there, there's jobs there, there's activities at every one of those stations. But I do get it. It was supposed to go to the North Campus, and that's how it gets this train to nowhere thing. And that needs to be corrected. The train really should go all the way to the North Campus. So that's the end of my talk. Um, there are two papers I want to alert people to. There's one, it's titled Mobility for Whom? Transit Equity in the Unaffordable City. It's by Rachel Gale McCain. If you are into uh, the concept of gentrification, this is a doctoral thesis that discusses gentrification and it has a huge section on Buffalo. So that is an excellent paper. Uh, UB uh, issued one called the Harder, we Want, uh, the Harder We Run, and it compares the state of Black Buffalo 1999 to what was current last year, September 2021. And I want to thank you. And this is where I was going to introduce Kelly Hayes McElhoney, uh, but we've already done that. So now I think it's time for our panelists to uh, respond. Um, well, thank you all for presenting and providing a lot of background information. Many of us who are in GSEU obviously come here from other places, so we're not really necessarily familiar with the background of NFTA and the prior sort of thinking through a rail system. Um, you know, broadly speaking, it sounds like while it might be more difficult to build and sort of operationally, the, the rail itself would probably be I think, the kind of ideal um, form of transportation, especially given that a lot of GSU members live downtown. So we're doing that kind of awkward getting to South Campus and then switching onto the blue bus. And then a lot of times it is really tight. Um, and so that kind of awkwardness, I think, would be mitigated by a rail that's just continuous all the way up. Um, I have a, a few questions, I guess, directed specifically. So um, my first or my two questions to Jeff initially are, um, would there be more frequent rail stops with the expansion? Because I know now sometimes at off hours, it can be um, you know, like 20 to 25 minutes at times to get a, a, a train. So would there be more frequent rail stops um, and then would the extension mean that there would be bus routes that would have to be discontinued or something to try to save funds? Because I think that the extension shouldn't come at the cost of eliminating rail lines or less frequent uh, or eliminating bus lines or less frequent bus line usage. Um, so I guess those are my two key questions. Sure. So as far as the timing goes, um, it, I think it would be very similar to how we currently operate. Special events always you know, throw a hitch into things about our operating times. Um, but that's something that we're evaluating as part of our DIS process. And I think as that progresses, we can you know, opine on that a little bit more. Um, as far as the bus network, I think it's reasonable to expect that we'd have to redesign bus work connections and how they would interact with an extension. Um, and as far as the stampede goes, I think our expectation is that we would get some UB riders naturally for the extension, because frankly, um, that plays a big part in our scoring with the Federal mm -hmm. Transit Administration's funding processes. You know, how many new riders we get and specifically what percentage of them are transit dependent um, because they um, count more towards our scoring criteria. Okay. Oh, thank you. That's it's, it's useful to know because a lot of because graduate workers on average are only making fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year, a car is just not sort of an option sure. unless you come to Buffalo with a car. You're certainly going to have a difficult time buying one and then all the associated costs. Um, so many of us, myself included, rely on and to get it around. Um, so thank you. Um, I have two questions. Do you want to go for that? No, I don't know. Okay. Um, two questions for Kelly regarding um, UB. So they're they're not uh, related. So I should say, um, 
one of them is regarding policing and thinking about if um, there will be an increased NFTA transit police and unique policing presence if there's going to be NFTA lines running through campus, um, just because I'm concerned with what kind of increased surveillance would look like on a campus, um, just from a perspective of, you know, unique police being kind of recognized with the same kind of um, uh, rights and privileges as Buffalo police, so what would that look like on this campus as it stands? Um, and then my second question, which, uh, like I said, related, is that if um, transit-oriented development is sort of less of a priority now with the new administration, um, I have a, a difficult time seeing the justified cost of the Lee Street sort of build-up, um, particularly given that I, I know it will be a you know, expensive cost that we just saw One World Cafe sort of um, balloon to two times what its original budget was. Um, so I know at least Speaking as the representative for VFU, a lot of our members are really concerned with the cost, um, given how low our stipends are. So I was wondering if that build is still going to be prioritized, given that the you know, current you know, presidential administration changed their priorities. Um, so yeah, I apologize, they're not related. <laughs> Those are the two questions that I thought of. No, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so the first, the answer to your first question is I don't have an answer for that. That is a that certainly is an important consideration, but it is uh, the type of uh, um, operational question that we you know we haven't really discussed yet how that will happen. I, but I will tell you that uh, safety and security is um, you know of primary importance to the administration, and you know when the time comes that that question will absolutely be addressed. But right now. We are focused more on, you know, the infrastructure and, um, you know, the ad, uh, advocacy for for the actual system. Uh, regarding your second question, I, and I, you know, I think that's a fair point. We, certainly, construction is expensive. There's no doubt about it. Um, I will say that for an institution of this size, our square footage allocation per student is significantly less than other institutions. So um, it, one of the benchmarks is, you know, the number of students versus the amount of buildings, square footage of buildings. And if you look at most of our peers, you can find that they have much larger campuses, more buildings and square footage than we do. So we have always been a very conservative institution in terms of building our infrastructure. Uh, and to, this, to that point, we are, to, to be honest, we're out of space. So you may realize that uh, right now on our North Campus, we are dramatically or drastically out of space. And so the issue that we are having is trying to renovate in place mm -hmm. and not be too disruptive to you students, not to impact your campus experience. So a couple of areas where we are incredibly uh, low in terms of square footage is in our uh, teaching labs, you may, mm -hmm. may know that already. So that's an area of concern. Our classrooms, we want to increase and enhance our classrooms and, and, and also in, in faculty offices and, and just general, you know, um, student offices, et cetera. So most of the projects that we are discussing uh, are in you know support of the educational experience. Or and and all of the student all of the projects directly impact the students. So these are these are when in, we weren't here, but in 2013 we hit a state in the debt ceiling, and we had a lot of projects in development that were stopped, um, and uh, we had to we had to look at phasing projects. We had to look at prioritizing, and the president in particular uh, was was dedicated to. But if nothing else, to do projects that would impact the student experience first. That's why all of the heart of the campus projects were built to the priority. So the, that was supposed to be one project, supposed to be the renovation of Cape and Talbert Norton all at once and be reimagined. But we had to do it in phases. So the first thing we did was this floor because this this directly impacts the student experience, a library. And you know, it's not a library that holds books, it's a library for student study. The second one was to create the one cape. So that was a huge priority. And then third, 
was the cafe. So all of these projects were direct, we knew would directly impact the students. And then the other thing I would say is that it, none of these projects are funded by your tuition. So you should be aware of that. So there is not a state funding, there are other sources of funding, but it's not, it's not, uh, it, these are not being funded by your needs, your tuition. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's very informative, and um, it was really um, brought more light into this project. And I appreciate the explanation. Um, I did have a question about the sort of um, light rail tram cars that would actually be used. So, um, from what I understand of my experience with the rail, but the current tram cars are um, refurbished. So, what sorts of new um, if you'll have to purchase new tram cars, will they be uh, replacements or will they be reintegrated or they would be refurbished? Um, so yeah, we would have to expand our metro rail fleet, obviously, to accommodate the new volume of passengers that we would have. But those would be all brand new. Okay. And, and you're correct, the current ones we do have are um, rebuilt. Oh, they're, so they're refurbished from the originals that we had in the 80s, um, which is cheaper to do that for us. But in many ways, they're, they're almost like brand new, right? You stripped them all the way down to the bones, rebuilt them back up with the new components and whatnot. So, but yeah, we would buy new ones um, for this project. So the new ones include um, sort of spaces that make more. So one difficulty is if you are carrying like bikes or if you have some sort of large bag with you, like you're transporting something from South Campus to downtown campus, and the there is sometimes like a large styrofoam container. We have a difficulty in maneuvering around in these train cars. So, um, will these new train cars that, because uh, like I have experience with refurbishments, but will these new train cars sort of um, keep in mind how like people may have different things that they're carrying with them, or they may have different sorts of modes like bikes or something? Will they have areas that will accommodate this? Yeah, no, that's a great question, a great comment. You know, at this point in the EIS process, we haven't got to what the actual trains or the infrastructure would look like, but um, I think that's something that we should consider as part of our, you know, comment period that's coming up for the DIS process. I think that's something that we would definitely see um, is, is a really valuable input. Um, you know, and of course, in the BRT option too, is, I don't know if you take our current metro buses, but we have the bike racks on front. Yeah. But that could be a challenge for people too, right? You have to know how to use that stuff. So I think education is also a component of that too, right? Where we have to educate our riders on how to utilize the amenities that we do have there. I had another question. Did I do that? No. No, that was Omar. Okay. You're on. I thought I had this button here. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so the other question that I had was um, the current route that is um, for the upcoming expansion, um, it traverses like the Grand Boulevard Mall and then there's any properties that in order to build. Yeah, you know, property acquisition is something that we have to look at as part of the EIS process too. A lot of the takings are not necessarily the entire takings, but because the right of, there are right of way impacts, there might be partial takings where we have to expand right away in some portion. But all that will be published as part of the EIS too, and the public have an opportunity to look at those potential takings and right of way impacts and provide them comments. And, uh, yeah, oh, thank you. We are, we conduct a number of master plans and we wouldn't place anything there that we would want to plan. We're not going to build that piece of those pieces here. We are planning a mixture of uh, residential, recreation, and um, academic space. So uh, the exact array is still in development and will be you know, as we as we need it. But we know that we want to add more student housing on campus. That would be the natural location along there. Um, we know that we need at least one new academic building, um, and then we are looking at also student service and uh, wellness recreation. Focused on students. Those are the key areas that we focus on. 
Um, I know that uh, Jacobs there is, or uh, students at Jacobs have the ability to purchase discounted and NFT passes, given that the rail would extend through North Campus, would an agreement regarding discounted and NFT passes be extended to undergraduate graduate students at the other campuses as well in the future? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something that we are always looking to partner with, not only the university, but other um, you know, businesses in the community too for their employees as a way to get them affordable, convenient access to the work sites, or in this case, between the UP campuses. So, so definitely as, as this project progresses, that's a conversation that we're continuing having with not only the University of Buffalo, but other stakeholders along the course. Okay, so um, I have a question from the chat. This is by Alexander. The question is, how does New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the Climate Act, factor into this? I would hope that LRRT would show positively in this. Who wants to tackle that? Doug? Doug, Doug our president of CRT, is on that committee, I think. Yeah, uh, I am. I'm on the committee. The county committee is looking at how to meet the, the state requirements from the Climate Leadership Protection Act. And the light rail is, is part of the plan uh, moving forward, extending light rail. So that, that holds well for this extension to, to the Andrews campus. We're also looking at other extensions to the East Side Airport and the South Towns potential as well. And I believe that this next state budget actually has some money in it to start the study of that. It's certainly been added to the NFTA plan after our encouragement for many years. And uh, Senator Tim Kennedy, I would give a shout out to him, he's been a big proponent of that and helping to make that happen. So that study is going to happen. As far as the CLCPA, the, the Climate Leadership Protection Act the requirements, it calls for reducing greenhouse gases by, I think it was 40% by 2030 and 85 by 20. I forget. It's very, very major, major reductions. Light rail is much, much more efficient and, and produces far less greenhouse gases per passenger mile than, than cars. So, yes, we think it's an important uh, part of meeting those requirements. And I always say it, 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 it's even better than that because, you know, when you take, you, you, you know, there, there is some use, of course, you know, per passenger mile, and even a light rail. But if you choose to take light rail and leave the car home, you know, you add a negligible amount of the increase in those gases by adding, you know, getting on a train that's already in service and leaving your car at home, you avoid all of that, all that pollution. And there's a big push for me that statewide that to, to really move towards electric vehicles, you know, and we think that's an important part of the solution for suburbs and so forth. But for the city, we think really light rail is a, is a solution. Because electric vehicles are still vehicles. They still have four tires, and tire pollution is a huge problem. We don't know what to do with them. It's not just the tires that you end up with that you have to put in the landfill or wherever, but it's when they wear out, they don't just vaporize. They generate all kinds of pollution that, that pollutes our, our soils and our rivers, and, and there's little micro plastic particles that are binding the kind of those tires together. They become airborne and they go all over the world. They even been found as far as the Arctic and Antarctic. You know, we need to get away from all the cars. We're going to be stuck with them far out in the suburbs. But certainly in the cities, our position is we need to move towards light rail and, and, and more efficient forms of public transportation. And we're very pleased that the the, the Amherst extension is starting to happen. There's there's, there's a movement uh, and a push and some money to start studying the other extensions. Uh, so we can have a real efficient system here, here in, in Buffalo. Buffalo. And the real advantage is that, that we have existing public rail rights of way. A lot of cities around the country would love to have the light rail system, and many of them are extended in that system, but we have public rail rights of way, so it's very, very important here. So we're going to keep pushing for it. The Andrews campus is the, is the first one to, to do it, so you know, we're we'll excited. So I have another online comment. This is from Bunny, a CRT member. Just seems to me that a light rail one seat ride is the smartest way to proceed. Making the connection from the train to bus rapid to go north is rather a short sighted way to begin a modern expansion. BRT would be extremely disrespectful to disabled riders. And um, 
I have a little bio from, uh, let's see, I got to scroll here. Get this whole thing here. Alexander Ivanov, uh, he is the Northeast Division Liaison for the Rail Passengers Association and beginning July is becoming a Western New York resident. And Alexander says, it's worth noting that Siemens has a light rail vehicle that is perfect for Buffalo and could be modeled for the NFTA's use with minimal difficulty. And he put a link to uh, information about that rail car. So that addresses what you were saying. So we've got some really, this is a really great chat. I'm like, <laughs> I'm impressed by what's going on here. Um, Members of the audience, uh, is there? Uh, oh, yes. Do we have any recent feedback from the Federal Transit Administration as to whether they will accept, whoops, it jumped, <laughs> accept light rail rapid transit as the preferred option, or are they still pushing BRT? Could the push for BRT have been a relic from the prior administration? Um, I don't know, Jeff. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's important to remember that the preferred option is a locally preferred option, not the Federal Transit Administration. It is a region's preferred option. And currently, the locally preferred option is still the light rail alternative um, and the use of the Niagara Falls Boulevard alignment that was a result of our alternative analysis process in which we advanced through the seeker process. Um, because FTA is the lead agency for the NEPA process, it is within their right to request an additional build alternative be evaluated but at the end of the day, the preferred alternative is still a locally made decision. So I hope that answers the question. Um, and somebody thanked us for answering their question. Uh, as for the existing rights of way, I could argue that we could build our Metro Rail for the same price of a phase two of a second avenue subway. Don't know what that means, but expensive. Carl says it's expensive. Okay, in the room, people in the room. I thought I saw a hand, yes. I'd like to say I'm all for light rail transit systems. I believe the future exists where you can have um, the light rail systems um, converse over other rail um, with smart technology. There's no reason you couldn't have a light rail system um, all of a sudden go over Conrail tracks if it, if there was a, a path to do that. Um, but the technology would make it safe. I think it's important to also a lot of talks about it's been about moving campus personnel back and forth. But for a system to really pass the muster of financial support, long term maintenance costs, you have to get the private sector to use it. So people go into factories and people just all leave in their apartment, retire, go into grocery stores and all that. And of course, accommodating uh, recreation use, possibly Allegheny State Park, traveling out. So I envision not concentrating too much money on fancy um, stops, but building out as fast as you can extended rails way beyond what's been discussed. And if, exactly with the spark technology like MyoVision and other technology, there's absolutely no reason you cannot have light rail go right down the center of Route 104, Route 31, Route 5, all the way out to Rochester. Absolutely no reason. You can generate all kinds of revenue to support that by traffic fines for people who don't yield to the, the new lighting systems will alert you that an oncoming train is coming down the center of the divided or undivided highway. And people realize, wow, all the traffic lights are stopping and I'm waiting at traffic lights and this metro rail is going to the destination. And people just by learning Day to day, what do they think? Maybe I want to use a park and ride that's halfway between Rochester, Medina, or Lockport and take a Metro Rail on 31. Once you realize that mindset um, generates revenue, that's where it's at. Because, you know, roughly, I think 36 million people in America are private sector. That all the income they get is from the private sector, not government subsidized or, or wages. The rest of the economy stays afloat by excise taxes and such. When excise taxes go up on oil and natural gas like we did last week, from 12.58% to 18.75% for natural gas and oil, that's costing every single manufacturing job more. 
we have to figure out how to control costs to make it viable so people want to move into a region like the Buffalo Niagara Frontier region, take advantage of this. We can't price ourselves out by just exclusively looking at a limited user base. We need to branch out and look at the private sector. And I believe that's how it will succeed in your wonderful side. So I would like to address that one because that gets me all excited. We have in our area, what's called a Metropolitan Planning Organization. Kelly mentioned that uh, acronym. That organization oversees all spending for federal monies for Erie and Niagara counties. They are thinking almost exactly what you just said. At their most recent meeting, they revealed that there will be a study of tra transportation, rail transportation between Buffalo and Niagara Falls. And this is, it's just what you're saying. I would recommend that you go to the GBNRTC public meetings. They, they have a monthly meeting. It's the first Wednesday every month, usually at 9.30 in the morning. It's online, Facebook. And just listen to what they say. I think we have one of the best MPOs in the country. I, I've gone to a couple, uh, again, <laughs> Kelly mentioned Real Evolution, a few of those conferences. And they really do have all of this in mind, the costs, what's the best bang for the buck. Uh, people don't realize Buffalo has heavy rail. We have Amtrak. It goes all throughout the region, goes Syracuse, Rochester, Utica, um, goes to Buffalo, Niagara Falls, and into Canada. It goes into uh, St. Catharines, Hamilton, and Toronto. And this is all served, like you said, heavy rail, and it's commercially viable service. Right now, we're just hoping that the Metro, the Amtrak can re give us service back to Canada. It's closed right now. Um, CRT, for the last three years, we've had a project on the drawing boards. We want to take that train. We want to analyze what happens when you go through customs. So, yes, all of this is being investigated and it's all very active. And the transfer, the, the federal bipartisan infrastructure law has money to do studies that was uh, referred to a little earlier. Uh, NFTA got some money. Uh, if you go to the Federal Transit Administration's website, you're going to find out uh, all of the rail cars in all of the public transit systems are going to be replaced. That's quite a chore. It's not just one or two systems. It's everybody, including us, hopefully. Uh, we'll get all new rail cars out of that. Even if we don't get our extension, we should still get new rail cars out of there. They're only 37 years old. Really? Now, you got to think about that. A bus lasts 10 to 12 years. You're lucky if you get that much out of it. Um, I meant to, I was going to ask Kelly. Did you get sticker shock when you looked into the price tags of battery electric buses and the charging stations and the support you have to do with mechanics and tools to support that? Because UB has said they want to go battery electric bus. Right, well, she said that's not my area, so uh, that's, I'm not involved in those conversations. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then I'll I'll just Chris is, uh, yeah. Chris that would have been a Chris question. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but basically, a battery electric bus costs two to three times the price of a regular old diesel bus. And it brings it much closer to the cost of a light rail transit car. It's getting to the point where there's not that much difference between the two. So you don't save a whole lot by going to BRT over light rail. Uh, you're looking at a million two for a, a, a battery electric bus that lasts 10 to 12 years. You're looking at $2 million for a rail car that lasts 37 years and maybe 40 or more. So over time, the, the cost difference, that light rail car saves you a ton of money. I don't know, maybe Jeff might have some other ideas about that. I mean, there are a lot of incentives to purchase electric buses, especially at the state level, too. And you do save, in the long run, with electric buses because they have they don't have a combustion engine, they have fewer removable parts, so the maintenance on them is uh, a little bit easier um, other than it actually had to handle the batteries. But there is a lot of upfront infrastructure that has to be put in to support them, right? Charging infrastructure, safety infrastructure as well. As far as how it compares to LRT vehicles, I guess I don't know, but you're right, it's about, a diesel bus is about half a million dollars and an electric bus is about. Yeah. It's important to note that, you know, the, the light rail transit, you don't have batteries. Yes, no batteries, no tires. No rubber tires. 
Um, and you have all types of technologies that you can utilize overhead power and rail. And there's all kinds of research being done in California to avoid fires from overhead lines that actually have the capability to put 100,000 volts through um, especially shielded cable buried in the ground. So the future has all kinds of opportunities to, you know, really save costs long term. This is more the like I said, you know, this I think push the light rail with the technology so you can pop on other tracks. You don't have to build other infrastructure. You can really sometimes use what you already have. So we are at time for the end of the meeting. Any other comments? Doug, do you want to say something to wrap it up? I did. I wanted to, and Carol's giving me the highest sign. Take one of these and the map in here. It's on brochures, and it's got a map of the of our idea for where the light rail should go, and, uh, and also a little bag. And they're not a website. Please join us. Uh, we really want you to get us from the news vote. Take a look and join us from our meetings. Speak up. Help us fight for these uh, extensions and improvements. So, uh, but anyway, take one of these because it has a map inside. And it we're talking about these are, as I said, these are mostly almost basically all probably one of the okay, So it's very, very affordable and it connects our region. It connects, you know, General Stadium, Niagara Falls, and so forth. And you can see what all everything is like. This time. So um, before we close, uh, Seth had a couple of things. Seth is a board member of Citizens for Regional Transit. Um, he commented about the 7th Avenue subway. He said that the, that route had to be underground and due to construction practice in the USA, it made tunneling very expensive. And he also said, yes, we at CRT have been waiting to see Go Transit expand to serve Niagara Falls and Buffalo, but the border is an issue. So um, those are things. And I thank everybody for coming. I especially thank our uh, uh, two speakers and our panelists. Well, that was great. And thank you very much. Um, and we're getting lots of nice things in the chat. Uh, thank you, everybody.